uh, you know, that's not to take anything away from the enlisted uh, folk that are in this room. It's just simply that my daddy, who was an enlisted Marine, always told me to talk about what you know about, okay? But I'm going to talk about the role of the enlisted uh, as well in, in, in the military and where I think it ought to be. Uh, as background, uh, I, was, I was born on a, uh, on a Marine Corps base, Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, cultural epicenter of the universe, uh, where my dad was a gunnery sergeant at the time. Uh, he left, uh, he, he never knew a peacetime Marine Corps. He was a, a combat Marine, World War II in Korea. I was born at the end of the Korean War, and soon after that, he left and returned to work for General Motors as a skilled tradesman. Um, I had never intended to really, I never thought much about joining the Marine Corps, other than the fact that I respected my dad and uh, uh, respected the kind of man he was. Uh, when I went into the Marine Corps, I had absolutely no intent of staying in for 37 years and becoming a general. My real aspirational goal, and I'll share with you, is to do three years in the Corps and buy a shrimp boat. <laughs> I failed. And, uh, you know, and now after Forrest, Forrest Gump did it, uh, you know, I, uh, I guess it's too late now. <clears throat> um, in fact, one of the, after I retired, I went to work for the uh, Commissioner for Customs and Border Protection, and as he looked at my bio, he looked, he said, he said, damn, Mike, you were the Forrest Gump of the Marine Corps. You've been everywhere. So I'll tell you a little bit about, you know, kind of what happened to me. Uh, my, I was telling some of the folks over in the table over here, my dad's advice was, listen to your staff NCOs, take care of your troops, and you'll do just fine. It's pretty good advice. Uh, so I came into the Corps and uh, stayed because I just kept getting better and better jobs. In the 37 years that I served, I, I had 13 commands uh, from, uh, from uh, platoon command. I had a couple platoons, three companies, a battalion, uh, a joint task group, joint task force, marine logistics group. And by the way, group kind of reads differently than it does in the Air Force. I think most of you here are Air Force. Uh, our groups are, are pretty big, about 8,000. Uh, uh, by the way, our battalions are big too. You ever wonder why Marines are always said, you know, you know a, a Marine, can you hear me? Okay, oh, I see. Uh, you ever wonder why a Marine battalion uh, took on an enemy division and beat them? And part of the reason is Marine battalions are huge. <laughs> uh, when I, my, my battalion was 2,300, if that would give you any idea. It was an engineer battalion, but it was the largest in the Marine Corps at the time. Um, I've had five joint tours. Uh, so I've had the uh, privilege of serving with uh, all branches of the service, uh, including the Coast Guard. And, uh, and, you know, quite often, because I'd had so many joint tours, I served, and uh, in my last uh, joint tour, I was the chief of staff of the U.S. Southern Command. So I often acted as the interpreter between the various services, because as we all know, the service cultures are much different from one another, which actually is a good thing, because just as we strive for diversity in uh, civilian organizations and in commands, the diversity in, in service cultures is a good thing. It's a good thing because you need different perspectives and different ways to solve the significant challenges that, uh, are, uh, that are thrown into the hands and at the feet of those of us who serve. So I think it's important that we celebrate the differences, but learn how to work with one another. And uh, I guess because I had five joint tours and I kept getting assigned more of them is because, you know, I, I guess I learned how to do that. As I told you, I was going to talk about the role of the military in a civil uh, society. And the first thing I would say is it's my belief that that role is expanding dramatically. And the reason for that, you can just have to look at the history right now of what's happening today. Um, and and I'll, I'll start by saying that, uh, and, and let you know beforehand, we'll talk more about politics towards the end, but I am officially apolitical. 
So if I say something that sounds like it's either critical of this administration or previous administration, it's simply an observation. It is not from the context of being a Democrat or a Republican or anything like that. I consider myself an American. And uh, I, have, uh, I have some concerns about our nation today. And some of my concerns actually are expressed around the role of the military and the amount that they're being used. Not because I object to it, but because in certain cases right now we are being used in ways that lead me to ask, where are the other organs of government at this time? And I will use a couple of examples from uh, the current history, okay? Right now, all of us are watching what's happening with the Ebola virus. It's an extraordinarily serious issue. And, uh, you know, one of the first things we ask ourselves is, you know, uh, you know, what's, you know, who's, who's orchestrating that? And you can always say, well, you know, the president is, but the president has to rely on certain people. And obviously, uh, if this was normal times, who would be orchestrating it? Does anybody know who in the government would be kind of calling the shots? CDC is what you're seeing, but there'd be somebody else. Surgeon General, does anybody know the name of our Surgeon General today? We don't have one, that's right. We don't have one, and yet we're facing what could be one of the most significant uh, medical problems facing this country in a long time. We don't have one because one has been nominated, the administration put them forward, but can't get confirmed, like so many other people. Um, and, and so I say that, you know, so what did we do? What was our first response for the Ebola virus? What did we do? Anybody know? But what did we do in Africa? You know, we already had the Doctors Without Borders there, but some folks that wore uniforms looked a little bit like yours. Yeah, we sent troops. Sent Army and I, we used Air Force transport to get them there, right? And I'm proud of that work that the soldiers and, and, and uh, airmen are doing right now. The real question in my mind is, why the military? Not that it's wrong, not that they're not going to do a great job, they are. But why was that our first response? Another example, and we're watching ISIS. <clears throat> you know, the president right now is trying to form a coalition. And uh, he should. You know, let's get some help here. Did we go to State Department and find the equivalent of uh, Henry Kissinger or Phil Habib? or George Kennan. By the way, in case you don't know those names and they're not familiar to you, those were great statesmen from State Department through our history. We didn't send one. We pulled my friend, uh, retired Marine General John Allen, out of retirement and got him to do it. Now, John Allen is as good an officer as you will ever find in the United States Marine Corps or in our armed forces. He is extraordinarily competent and he's well respected. But this was not a military job. It was a diplomatic mission. So the question comes back is why are we expanding the role of the military so much? And I would argue that the administration doesn't have too many options because, but the problem you come into is that if you have a toolbox where all you have is hammers, Every problem is a nail. So we're going to have to be thinking about that, but it does cause us, those of us that have worn the uniform and those of you who are wearing the uniform today, to ask yourself about the role of the military. And every, every country uses their military in different ways. If you went to China, you'd find that they're running chicken farms and factories and everything else. and. Uh, you know, and many of their generals are getting fairly rich. I know that. Uh, my son married the uh, air marshal for the People's Republic of China, so, you know, the, the, daughter, the granddaughter of the air marshal, so, you know, I kind of know about these things. Uh, but they, uh, every, every country uses their, their military a different way. I want you to think about something. And this might guide your behavior and uh, your, 
work as we uh, as uh, as you move forward. But I think I'll start first by talking a little bit about Guantanamo. Amy mentioned that uh, I served twice in Guantanamo, and I'll tell you about both of those occasions, and uh, and I'll tell you about the predicament that I found myself in when I was being asked to do things that I felt may not be consistent with my oath of office. Because I think that might be useful today for, the, for, for this, uh, this luncheon. Um, when I was a brand new colonel, actually frocked, I was sent down to take a charge of 13 Cuban and one Haitian migrant camp uh, in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. Uh, at the time that I went down there, there were about 18,000 Cuban migrants and a couple of hundred Haitians. The, um, the diplomatic decision as to what to do with these individuals was different depending upon their country of origin. What you may or may not know is, and Perhaps those of you at the, the round tables, most of you are of a certain age, probably don't even remember it. Some of you further back might. But uh, the Clinton administration had signaled that there may be a change to the immigration policy in the U.S. And acting on faith, the whole bunch of migrants from Haiti and Cuba got into leaky boats, set out into the, uh, uh, into the straits, and headed for Florida. At the same time, there was a terrible storm Tens of thousands of them drowned. And those that did not drown were picked up by our United States Coast Guard and taken to Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. Now, Guantanamo Bay, Cuba operates a very interesting extra-legal uh, place. And I know we've got at least one JAG officer. How many JAGs do we have in here? We've got one. Anybody else? OK, we've got a couple. OK. It, it occupies a very interesting place uh, because it's, it, it is uh, a, we occupy that piece of property based upon a three-page piece of paper that was signed at the end of the Spanish-American War. If you ever get a chance to read it, it is a remarkable document. It, uh, it secures that property for us so that the U.S. Navy can use it for coal refueling. I am somehow convinced that somewhere in a desk in Subi at uh, Guantanamo, there is probably a piece of coal, so we are legally still continuing to abide by the terms of the lease. It requires us to pay a certain amount of money to the government of Cuba every year. Since Fidel Castro, and his brother, Ramon, took uh, control. Uh, we have paid that lease to them, but they've only cashed one check, and they cashed that one by accident. So they have not cashed any of the checks because they do not recognize uh, the fact that we, uh, we have that, uh, uh, that we are there at that property. There is a fence that separates sovereign Cuba from the base and a minefield. There used to be a minefield on both sides. The Cuban minefield is still there. Uh, the, uh, the U.S. minefield uh, had, was taken out during the Clinton administration. The uh, Cuban minefield is not maintained, uh, and uh, it, it's every once in a while uh, mines just explode spontaneously. Uh, <clears throat> there is a path through the minefield and a meeting place on both sides, both the U.S. and sovereign, uh, sovereign Cuba side, uh, where people can meet, and I would meet regularly with the head of the Cuban Frontier Brigade, uh, and uh, we would just discuss housekeeping issues. It was also used by uh, the uh, U.S. interest section in Havana. Uh, those meetings were used to pass information back and forth because we really didn't have diplomatic uh, relations with Cuba. So in my first time down there, I, I suddenly became something of a I guess, uh, a, a mouthpiece for the U.S. State Department. Um, ironically, when I came back six years later, the Frontier Brigade commander who has been returned back, he was now a Brigadier General, I was now a Brigadier General. We would talk, I'd ask him how his daughter was, he would say, you know, she's got married, and he said, how are your boys? Well, they're in college, okay. And then when, we would, and this was, these conversations all take places, we're walking through the minefield, because those was the only areas that weren't bugged. 
And then, of course, once we got in our respective places, you know, I was a capitalist running dog and he was a commie pig. But, uh, you know, things like that happen. Uh, so I had these uh, 18,000 Cubans who were economic refugees and ultimately as Attorney General Janet Reno uh, announced that uh, the Cubans would be allowed to come to the, uh, their country of uh, uh, coming to the United States, providing they had not committed any serious crimes. And the Haitians, unless they could prove that they were uh, uh, political refugees, would be sent back to Haiti. Two different rules, two different decisions. And I had to execute both of those. You know, and it's tough putting a little six-year-old Haitian kid that's an orphan back on an airplane and send him to Haiti because he can't establish that he is a political refugee. But I did those things. So, you know, even things I didn't like doing, I did. Now, if we fast forward to, to uh, we fast forward to the uh, uh, areas that your era that you would all remember, which is, you know, uh, after 9/11, <clears throat> and. Uh, the administration, because all administrations have used uh, Guantanamo as the flotsam and jetsam of their particular administration policy. It's just a good extra legal place to park people. So they got to thinking about, you, you know, what was going on. And I had a force already in Afghanistan. As you recall, you know, we went into Afghanistan and uh, we went after the Taliban and the Al Qaeda. And uh, we did a pretty good job of rolling them up, although we did not catch Osama bin Laden. And so, as we're watching what's going on there, and you probably recall this was in October and November, uh, you, if you've been to Af Afghanistan, and I expect some of you know, you know what uh, Afghanistan is like as the winter approaches. And I will assure you that the infrastructure then was much less than it is now. So we were catching people all over on the battlefield, some of them wounded, and many of them from different countries, countries that, we, that surprised us. We were picking up Brits. We had a Dane, a German, U.S. personnel. And many of them didn't have very good reasons for why they were there. On top of that, as the, the, as the weather was getting colder, we had no place to put all of these, what we were calling at that time, enemy prisoners of war. Now, unknown to me, there was a huge debate going on within the administration in terms of what should be done with these people. One, uh, one group, most of them the military and particularly led by the JAG officers, bless their hearts, because I agreed with them, you know, it makes you feel pretty good that a Marine General would agree with the JAG officer, doesn't it, Major? Yeah. Uh, they were pushing to get these folks into the United States and not into Cuba, and, and regardless of where we went, to make them subject to the Constitution. Another group was pushing to get them into Guantanamo and felt that uh, the Geneva Convention should not apply and that these folks would be an intelligence uh, windfall. Ultimately, there was something of a compromise, but the guidance that I received, and by the way, I was selected with my command to go down there, and there were two reasons for it. First reason was, is they figured, well, if I've done migrants, I ought to be able to do detainees or enemy prisoners of war. Now, the logic, I guess, makes perfect sense inside the Beltway, but I will sh assure you that there is a vast difference between a Cuban economic migrant that has broken no laws of this country and none of his country other than to leave illegally and uh, someone who is probably a member of Al-Qaeda and has killed a lot of folk. Okay, there is a difference between them. But in the minds of uh, the policymakers there's not much difference, and we'll put them in Guantanamo, and we'll send Brigadier General Leonard down there. And the other th reason was that they were supposed to go down there, that they decided to send us, is that my unit had the, was in the op plans in the event of another Cuban migrant crisis to respond. And this is taking nothing away from any soldier that's out there, but the soldiers who had the doctrinal mission for uh, doing the, uh, running enemy prisoner of war camps, which as you know, the Army has that as a doctrinal mission, couldn't get there in the time frame that they wanted. 
And so on a Sunday morning, I got a mission, set of mission orders, which read basically, form a joint task force at Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, deploy to Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, and have the first 100 cells ready to receive the first detainee in 96 hours. Now, I know we got one guy in a Red Horse squadron out there, so you kind of know as an engineer, that's, that's a fairly, fairly tough mission to get do all of this. I remember as we were deploying from Cherry Point, and we had this Marine Warrant Officer walk up, and he saw us loading the C-17s to get down there, you know, actually on Sunday night. So less than 12 hours later, we're already loading stuff. So we're doing this from a cold start. And he walked up to me and he said, oh, don't feel too bad, General. I've seen planned uh, deployments that went worse than this. So, uh, so as I got down there, uh, one of the things that we began to see is that uh, uh, we were getting a lot of conflicting guidance, particularly on the legal side. The status of these individuals, even what they were to be called. Initially, when I went down, they were, they were enemy prisoners of war. Then later on, they were, we were told that they had to be called detainees. And one of the most interesting pieces of advice that I received is that, uh, that I could be guided by, but not to follow the Geneva Conventions. And at that point, I made a personal, a personal decision that I was going to follow the Geneva Conventions in every way that I possibly could, with the, and, and that if there was an exception made, that I and I, I alone would make the, dis the decision whether or not to follow it. I would not leave my troops with the same level of ambiguity as, was being as I was experiencing. At some point, the ambiguity has to stop. So I made a decision in three different areas and lost the fight on the, th on the fourth one in terms of what I wouldn't do. I didn't house my troops in the same conditions as the detainees, as was required by the Geneva Conventions. I did not pay them in Swiss francs in accordance with their rank. Most of them wouldn't tell me what their rank was. And finally, I didn't give them any musical instruments, although I will tell you that I was even asked that question by the press whether or not I was going to give them musical instruments. And uh, I always wanted to respond, well, I guess we could form a Taliban. <laughs> My public affairs officer strongly recommended that I not do that. <clears throat> to this day, I wish I had. Now, the one area where I lost the fight was that I wanted them to get receive Article 5 hearings. And I really felt that they should have received Article 5 hearings at the point of ca capture. And essentially what that is, is that uh, when you capture somebody, you essentially have a, a, a short hearing that says, okay, what were the circumstances this individual was captured? What evidence do we have to believe that they are an enemy combatant? Uh, you know, what are, what's going on here? In most cases, that wasn't done. I used to say that it took that an army or a marine captain could make a decision to put a detainee on a plane for Guantanamo, and it took the President of the United States to send him back. And if you think about it, some of the things that were happening over there, 80% of the detainees that I had were not picked up by U.S. forces. They were turned in because we were paying $3,000 to $25,000 each for these people. Now. I don't know how much you all know about Afghan tribalism, but if you're living in a valley and you're, a mem you're the tribal chieftain of Tribe A, and the valley next door to you is Tribe B, and you've been fighting that tribe for six generations. In fact, his great-grandfather killed your great-grandfather. And some soldier or Marine comes up to you and says, do you know any bad guys out there? I'm paying for bad guys, $3,000 to $25,000, depending upon how bad they are. What would you do? You'd solve your biggest problem and get more money than you'd seen in the last five years. So we started seeing people showing up, and some of them were indeed the worst of the worst. Others 
just had the bad fortune to have been sold out by their enemy before they could sell the other guy out. About 559 of the 779 detainees that have been held in Guantanamo have been sent back to their country of origin without any action whatsoever. What that means is that our sorting process was really, really bad. We didn't do a good job. So we got those folks there, and uh, I began having some, some concerns. And this is where I'm going to start talking about, you know, what do you do when your chain of command tells you something to do something that you think may not be the best thing to do? And I hope that we can have a little talk here today. Now, I'm really glad that we have both officers and enlisted here today because I'm going to make a distinction here. And I'm going to ask each of you and if, uh, to, to recall back does the Air Force, I think we have mostly Air Force here, does the Air Force have you repeat your oath of enlistment each time you get promoted? Do you? But for the officers and enlisted? Officers, it's optional, but most officers. Yeah, okay. That's the same for the Marine Corps, except for in our case, it's not optional. Uh, you are a gentler and kinder service. Uh, we always take the oath each time we're promoted. And so first off, I'm going to repeat the oath for those of you that are commissioned officers. And I'd like you to listen to the words. I, Michael R. Leonard, do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, and that I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office upon which I am about to enter. So help me God. Now, what for the enlisted, do you see anything missing in that oath? What's that? Very good, sir. Very good. The enlisted oath has the words, and I will obey the orders of the President of the United States and the officers appointed over me. Why would you think that that is left out of the officer's oath? Any ever thought of that? Do you think they just made it up differently by accident? Or do you think that the officers don't have to follow the orders of the President of the United States or the officers of Point of Of course they do. But they wanted to leave out a certain level of ambiguity. You gotta remember that this oath was, was written a long time ago. But there's something very significant had happened during the Revolutionary War that probably made some very wise, not only framers of the Constitution, but framers of those oaths. Think about it. Anybody remember the circumstances of Benedict Arnold? What was Benedict Arnold? Besides being a traitor, that's what we all learned in school. What was his rank? He was a major general. And actually, if you study the history, he was a pretty effective major general in the Revolutionary War. But he didn't feel like he was getting enough credit for the work he was doing. And so he went to the other side. Now, I can't prove this, but I think that the framers of those two oaths said, you know something? If a senior officer or political appointee asks us to do something that we shouldn't do, we better have somebody in that chain of command that says, hey, just a minute. My oath is to the Constitution of the United States, and that trumps everything. So it's not that we're not supposed to follow the chain of command, and it's not that we're not supposed to follow the orders as officers of those appointed over us, including the President of the United States. But ultimately, we are also supposed to have the wit and the discernment to ask ourselves whether we are functioning in accordance with the Constitution. Now, <clears throat> I will tell you that mine is still a minority view. There are commissioned officers in the U.S. Armed Forces who do not agree with me, and they are welcome to that disagreement. But my view is that the Constitution does not stop at the water's edge, and that those of us that go out in harm's way of all services 
took an oath to the Constitution, and when we deploy and go out into foreign lands, that we are still subject to that Constitution. And I also feel that those aspirational goals expressed in the Constitution and in the, United, and in the, the Declaration of Independence are extraordinarily important. I also recognize in our history we have not always left, led, we have not always kept up with those goals. Those of you that are women know that we have not always treated women as if all men were created equal. Those of you who are people of color know that we have not always treated you right. But I still think that the fundamental, bedrock, aspirational goals of the Constitution are extraordinarily important. So when I was told that I was to run the detention facility, I made the decision that I would run that facility in accordance with those goals and treat these individuals with a level of humanity that they probably did not deserve. In fact, I would have some interesting conversations with my Marines and soldiers who were responsible for running the camp. You know, it takes a little guts for a young 19, 20 year old Marine or soldier to ask the general, why are we treating them this well? They wouldn't treat us that way. It's a fair question. And I would always respond, it is a fair question. It's an absolutely correct observation and it's totally irrelevant. Because if, they, if we treat them as they would treat us, we become them. So, you know, this, and, and by the way, um, you know the history of Guantanamo. You know the shameful history of Abu Ghraib. You know that didn't last. Ultimately, I was force listed. I can use that term here among you all because you know what for, I had to explain to all the civilians what force listing meant, but essentially uh, my command and I were all force listed to go to support the invasion of Iraq. So when I was sent down there, I was actually sent down to be there for 60 days. I ended up being down there for uh, just about 100 days. And they set down an Army uh, Joint Task Force and um, they carefully selected the Army commander. This is no hit on the Army, by the way. Any soldiers that are in here, we've got some incredibly superb people. But they sent down somebody that had a different view than me. So I never got fired by the Secretary of Defense. He came down twice to talk to me. We had some interesting conversations. But he wasn't about to fire the Marine General that stood up Guantanamo. I knew that. Now, if I'd been down there for a year, he would have fired me because I wasn't doing what he wanted. I, I did not support enhanced interrogations then, during the time that I was uh, on active duty, and I don't know. In fact, I view that what we euphemistically refer to in many cases as enhanced interrogation techniques are nothing more than torture. And I don't support that. Now, there's some of you in this room that may think that's okay. And, you know, you're, you're welcome to that belief. But the day may come, and by the way, I, when I was a major, I never thought I'd end up being a major general. I never thought I'd be a captain, so um, it could happen to you. And you're going to have to make those types of decisions. Now, I will tell you that, that the, the number of times I think that a military officer will be put in that kind of a position are very, very few and far between. And I think most, I think the vast majority of military officers will go through their lives without ever having to make that kind of a decision. But what I would say to you is this, if you are put in that position that you have to make that decision, go back to the bedrock foundational values of the Constitution. And understand also that you have a responsibility to your enlisted troops who don't have, do not have the authority to make those distinctions. They must follow the orders of the officers of the President of the United States and the officers appointed over them. Don't put them in a position where they have to put their ethics and lock them away in their sea bag. 
Don't do that to them. And if you have to do something that really makes you very uncomfortable, like when I had to put six-year-old Haitian kids back on a plane, take the time to explain to your troops why we're doing this. They deserve it. Because they're going to live with those actions the rest of their lives. They are going to be probably, that, that Air Force Master Sergeant may be the last military person that kid sees. And those eye, tears will be coming down that kid's eyes. That Master Sergeant better know why this country is doing that. And better have a fairly good understanding even if they don't like it. Because as officers, you owe that to, to them. Um, I'm going to end talking a little bit about politics because uh, I told you earlier on I'm officially apolitical. Even my wife does not know how I vote. And I do that for a reason. Uh, last night when I did this, the, the speech in Wichita and everything, a lady came up and she was absolutely, she could not understand when I told her that I was apolitical. She says, you must be a Republican or a Democrat. You've got to be something. Well, I'm an American, ma'am. Well, you've got to be something. Everybody is. No, ma'am, I'm not. And just think about what this country would be like if we uh, had a military that aligned itself with one political party or another, or for goodness sakes, you know, assigned people to squadrons and battalions based upon their political leanings. By the way, there are countries that do that. And you know what happens. Uh, they have revolutions. They have military coups. And so I would say to those of you that never wore the uniform, be very, very happy that most of us don't ever say what political party we belong to. I honestly told the, uh, the, secretary, the previous secretary of the VA, not General Sinsaki, but a previous secretary of the VA, was absolutely convinced that I must be a Republican because he was a Republican and I was a good guy. And everybody, aren't, aren't all generals Republicans? And I looked at him and I said, you know, I know every single Marine general in the Marine Corps. And I don't know the political party of a single one of them. He was flabbergasted. I said, we don't do that. We don't do that. And we're getting near an election season, and I suspect that you've all had the appropriate uh, counseling on your base about inappropriate political behavior. In other words, don't go to, I mean, you can support somebody. You can put a, and, and Jag, if I get out of line, you just tell me, okay? I believe you can put a sign in your, in, uh, if you have a house out in Wichita, you can put a sign up that says vote for so-and-so. Is that correct, sir? If it's off the installation. Off the installation, right? See, because you can't do it on the installation. That's why I said out in Wichita. But you're exactly right, counselor. By the way, when I like a, a lawyer, I call him counselor. Uh, <laughs> but if you go to a political rally in uniform, what's going to happen? Problems. Problems, yeah. And so, you know, we're, we're into an election season, and, and, but, but think, there really is a, a, an, an overarching and really good reason why we keep out of this stuff. Because our job is to defend all the American people, not just those of the same political party that we belong to, or that have different beliefs, or different objectives, or different goals. We're there for everybody. And I think that should be just a wonderful feeling for the American people. I think I'm going to stop there. But I would really like to take some questions, if you don't mind. Um, does anybody have any questions for me? This is your chance. And there aren't any questions that, uh, that are uh, verboten. You can ask me anything you want. I'm retired. Sir. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you cared to comment. You were in Iraq uh, around 2004, did you say? 
I was there for the initial invasion of Iraq, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of talk about, well, why are we bringing the Marines in to do this particular job? That's not what they do. What, I mean, what was your impression on the mission that you were given as a Marine going in there? Mm -hmm. Well, the mission I had when we went in there was to uh, assault from Kuwait to Baghdad and get there in 17 days. There was absolutely no question that that was a perfect mission for us. Okay. And that was the part that I was involved in. The, 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 here's, here's what I was concerned about. And this is to my point, sir. And, and by the way, in case, did everybody hear the question? Everybody get it? Because I'm supposed to repeat the question. Basically, you know, uh, you know, what was my reaction to uh, missions that were given to the Marine Corps that may be outside of their mission set? Is that a correct? You know, yeah. OK. And let me, let me say, here's where my concerns lie. First off, if the other organs of government don't learn how to do this, uh, we can't put countries back together after we break them. It's real simple. I'm using Marine terms. I got an Air, Air Force guy down there. Since I'm I'll tell you what, he uses small words. Uh, you know, uh, the issue that we're dealing with here is that when we got to Baghdad in 17 days, we experienced what I call catastrophic victory. We got there so fast and so effectively that everything else that was supposed to be in place wasn't there. And you were in Iraq, sir, and you may have been there early enough to see what the Iraqis did. And they said, okay, you won. What are we gonna do? What's the government gonna look like? What's uh, and everybody's going, you know, and the military at that point was being told, mission, uh, nation building isn't your job. Well, where are the nation builders? And they weren't there. You know, we actually had a pretty good model for nation building because I was also involved in Just Cause in Panama. You know, remember I said I was the Forrest Gump of the Marine Corps. And uh, so I was down in, uh, in uh, uh, Panama as the uh, ground operations officer for uh, the Southcom uh, under General Maxwell Thurman. Most of you aren't old enough to remember who Maxwell Thurman was. He was, he was indeed a high-functioning sociopath, but he was a brilliant Army general. And uh, so uh, he's dead now, bless his heart. He uh, died of cancer. He beat it the first time because nobody would believe a cancer cell could live in Maxwell Thurman. <laughs> And, um, but um, he was a brilliant man. And we spent about five days fighting, and the fighting was tough. On some bases, we killed every member of the PDF. But right after that, we brought them all in, and we figured out, okay, how close were they to Manuel Noriega? And if they weren't particularly close, we put them back to work. We put them in a different uniform. One of my jobs was to figure out what uniform the new PDF should wear. So we had to change things. We put them in uniform, we got them directing traffic, we got them you know, doing all the things that the PDF had done in the past within 10 to 14 days. Right back to work again. These same people we'd been shooting at. You know, when we went into Iraq, not every Iraqi military force uh, reacted the same way. Some of them stayed in garrison, and grounded their weapons, and waited till the fight was over with. Some of them fought like tigers. At the end of the fight, we treated them all the same way. You remember that? I'd opine that, you know, just like Colin Powell said, the old pottery barn principle, you know, if you, if you break it, you bought it. We broke it, and we owned it. But we didn't put it back together again. Uh, you know, in terms of your, your question about mission creep and Marines doing things. We kind of like doing that stuff. You know, by the way, the Marine Corps has a unique aspect of their role under Title 10 that none of the other services do, which is one of the reasons that we were able to put Marines into the LA riots. You know, because those of you that are JAGs know, well, how do you get around posse comitatus? You know, because the rest of the, rest of the services, you know, you don't, you don't do that kind of stuff, unless you're National Guard, right? 
I'm going to look into the JAG officer. But there's one line in the Title X for the Marine Corps that says, and such other missions as the President may direct, which means any damn thing he wants us to do. Next question, please. Sir. Yes, sir. Who are? Yeah, be glad to answer that first, Sergeant. Okay, the question was: Is uh, what's my stance on uh, on uh, Guantanamo Bay, and should it be closed? And 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 first off, it absolutely needs to be closed. And by the way, uh, not just this president, but the pre previous president said it needs to be closed. Secretary of Defense Robert Gates said it needs to be closed. In fact, I spoke out while I was still on active duty because I was asked a question like that in a public forum. And I answered it. Now, active duty generals aren't supposed to uh, talk about policy. But at the same time, I wasn't trained to lie to people either. So I said, we need to close it. And I explained why. And I'm going to explain why to you for certain. And I stood by that day and I said, well, I guess, my, I guess I'm done. It was a good run. And it got reported in the papers, and boy, did it went viral. And I got a little note. I have it hung up in my office. It's from Robert Gates. It said, General, well said. I agree with you. Bob. I figured I was out of trouble then. <laughs> but, you know, just saying it ought to close is not good enough. We've got to give you some answers, and you're asking for them, and that's a fair question. There are 155 detainees left down there. Of those, about 78 have uh, been determined by uh, commissions and boards, review boards, taking a look at everything that they could find on these folks, and they said they need to be sent back to their country of origin. And by the way, in some cases, that was determined 10 years ago, and they're still there. Now, there's reasons that they're still there. In some cases, uh, the countries that they come from don't want them back. That makes it difficult. In other cases, the countries that they come from are those countries where we cannot be absolutely certain that they won't have their human rights violated. Now, I am less concerned about their human rights being violated because right now, I try to, you know, as my Jesuit logic instructor would say is, so it's okay to violate their human rights so that you can keep them from getting, having their human rights violated someplace else. I got a little problem with that. Now, of the remainder of those, about, about 70 odd people, some of them are very bad guys for certain, really bad guys. And uh, about, 40 of them have been determined as uh, designated for indefinite detention and held without any charges, which as a, I don't know about you, for those of you that are, have studied the law, that makes me uncomfortable. But I do accept that they're bad guys. And there are others that have been found guilty by the commission. There's actually only one down there that's been found guilty by the commission and being held. Uh, there were a couple of others that were found guilty by the commission uh, and sentenced to time served and then just released. And then a couple who were found guilty by the commission and uh, the Supreme Court overturned it, our Supreme Court. And then there's a number of them that are just waiting trial. Now, the first thing that I would say is, is that as a nation of laws, our military commissions, we haven't really done military commissions since Nuremberg. We're not really that good at it. And the federal courts are good at it. So the first thing first, Sergeant, I would say is bring them back here, and those that can be tried should be tried under the federal court system. And if they're found guilty, lock them up for the rest of their natural life. For those that we don't have enough information, 
And we have to turn them loose. And yes, some of them will be recidivists. They will go back to the fight. Right now, the estimates are, depending upon what you define as a recidivist, are 4 to 24 percent of those that we released, of the 559 that we released, got back to the fight. So it's anywhere between 20 and 75. We don't know. We know that there's some because we've killed them. And we know that there's some still out there. But we've got pretty good biometrics on them, and our military is the best military in the world. So when we release them, we tell them, you know, go back. If you say you're going to go, go find, you know, marry your hometown girl and start a bakery, go ahead and do it. And if you decide you want to go back and be a terrorist, go ahead. We don't recommend it. And if you do it, we're going to kill you. Simple as that. Now, we've heard some people say, oh, we can't bring them here. They're too dangerous. If there's one thing this country is good at, it's locking people up. We know how to do it. Anybody ever visited a supermax prison? Pretty good, isn't it? It's pretty, it's pretty tight. It also costs $78,000 a year to put a prisoner in the most expensive supermax prison in, in this country. It costs $2 million a year to hold a detainee at Guantanamo. So if I can't convince you any other way other than the fact that it's a heck of a lot of taxpayers' money, we probably ought to do it. But did that answer your question first, Sergeant? Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. How long ago did you retire? 99. 99. Well, hope you're enjoying your retirement. Great. Are there other questions? Um, yes, sir. The, uh, you, you mean the part that talks about uh, being able to indefinitely detain uh, U.S. citizens? I'm opposed to it. I think we've just, I, I, all I would say is go back to the Constitution. You know. And by the way, you know, these are not, I mean, I, I don't want to sound like, well, that boy, that's simple. I mean, these are tough, these are tough decisions. But here's the thing, <clears throat> no politician wants to do anything that's going to put them at risk in the next election, that they have to explain to the American people why somebody got loose. And it's a, this is the topic of a completely different lecture, but all I will say is what terrorists try to do is make us live in fear. I refuse to live in fear. I'm willing to accept a certain level of risk for the protection of my civil liberties and the civil, civil liberties of every other American, period. Anybody else? Well, Amy, Dean, how long have you been a Dean now? Two months. Two months. Thank you very much. I appreciate it for all of you. I wish that you all have a great day and go forth and do great things. Thank you. Thank you, General. I just wanted to point out in our program, you might have noticed there were three events that we held this week that, that the general participated in. If you want to get the recorded link or the link to the recording of any of those events, we have a sign-up sheet somewhere. It, it, and the links are on our website. Okay, the links are on our website, pskans.edu. Uh, all right. My next uh, duty is to call Andy up, our provost. I'm Andy Shepard. I'm the provost. And if you're not a professional nerd, that makes me about the chief of staff for the, for the institution. OK? And on my way in here, General Leonard said to me, will there ever be a college that isn't military friendly? I didn't have a good answer for him, but I will tell you this. Here's what it means to me, General. It means that uh, good students make good teachers. Good teachers make good students. We got 20 years of serving the military. So for those of you in the room, I mean no offense, but I've had some good students 
and they've taught me a few things. In general, this has absolutely no currency in any officer's club, so if you lay it down, you will have to buy the beer. But the Woodrow Wilson Fellows program uh, allows us to bring very accomplished people to speak to our students. Uh, we are proud to serve the military, and even though you're not enrolled, uh, the general was kind enough to, to agree to this event. So it's a little bit above and beyond of, of what a Woodrow Wilson Fellow would do. So, General. Thank you. Thank you for your work. Thank you, Provost. By the way, Provost is not only Chief of Staff, but he's the lash of Southwestern. <laughs> Thank you very much. I will treasure this, and I, 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 will, uh, I will put it right next to the one I received from Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.